So thank you for joining us for the second webinar in our fall series. The series theme is Trauma and Healing, Teaching and Learning in Today's Climate. My name is Kim Klett, and I am the Deputy Executive Director for the Educators Institute for Human Rights. EIHR cultivates partnerships among educators globally to create materials and deliver training based on best practices in Holocaust and human rights education. Together, we deliver content and strategies for teaching conflict history and prevention and sustainable peace. Learn more about us at EIHR.org. After we end the program and the recording today, feel free to stay on if you have further questions for our guests. We would love to continue an informal discussion for those of you who would like to stay on for another 10 or 15 minutes. We are so happy to have so many of you with us today, again, from a wide variety of places. We know you will enjoy today's session, Native American Boarding Schools and Generational Trauma. We hope you can join us December 11th when our staff librarian, Matthew Good, will interview author Amy Sarig King on her young adult novel that I have here, Attack of the Black Rectangles, which is about censorship of a Holocaust book. And I'll put that registration info in the chat box in just a little bit. EIHR recently added two new members to our board of directors. One, Maureen Costello, led Teaching Tolerance, which is now Teaching for Justice, at the Southern Poverty Law Center. And most recently, was executive director of the Center for Anti-Racist Education at Stand for Children Leadership Center. And the other new board member is with us today, Dr. Samuel Torres. Dr. Torres is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition and has been a fundamental part of the team since 2019. Dr. Torres first joined NABS as the Director of Research and Programs where his contributions have included leading research teams through several projects such as the Indian Child Removal Study with the First Nations Repatriation Institute and the University of Minnesota, as well as the development of Indian boarding school research and coordinating with the US Department of the Interior's Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. Samuel has a doctorate in educational leadership for social justice from Loyola Marymount University, and his work encompasses the impacts of colonization on historical and contemporary education methods, particularly the legacy of boarding schools. With his extensive experience as a researcher, writer, educator, and leader, Dr. Torres holds a deep passion for decolonizing fixed knowledge systems, centering ancestral knowledge and histories, and working in community to promote indigenous futures. A bicultural human being, Dr. Torres is Mashika Nawa on his father's side and Irish Scottish from his mother. In addition to actively learning and practicing Nahua language, traditions, and ceremony, he belongs to the Mexica kinship community, Kalpuli Yoshinoshli in St. Paul, Minnesota. Dr. Torres, we are so happy to have you with us today and to have you on the EIHR board. And speaking with Dr. Torres today is Dr. Ramona Klein, an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa located in Belcourt, North Dakota. As a young child, Ramona attended board, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs or BIA boarding school, an Indian mission school, public school, and a BIA day school. Ramona dropped out of high school, married while still a teenager, and is the mother of two children. She divorced while her children were young. Ramona completed a GED to earn an equivalent to a high school diploma. She took advantage of an opportunity to attend college while working as a teacher's aide, earning a bachelor's of science. She went on to earn a master's of education in special education and a doctorate of education in educational leadership. Ramona has had the honor and privilege of teaching students kindergarten through graduate study, uh, studies in tribal, public and private education. She has uh, served as a teacher's aide, classroom and special education teacher and diagnostician, assistant professor, associate professor, and professor and university administrator. 
Ramona has served on human service advising and education standard boards at the local, state, regional, national, and international levels. She has had the privilege of working in some capacity in all 50 states, such as speaking, training, consulting, teaching, serving on accredi accreditation and or evaluation teams. She is self-employed, uh, a self-employed education and leadership consultant and is semi-retired. She and her husband, Chuck, spend their retirement playing in the dirt or gardening in North Dakota and relaxing and playing in the sun in Arizona. Ramona and I recently found out that we don't live that far apart from each other. These experiences happened because Ramona said yes to an opportunity that was offered to her. Dr. Klein, we are so honored to have you here with us today, and we thank you gen for generously offering your time to share your experiences with us. And before beginning their conversation, Dr. Torres will offer our land acknowledgement. Thank you. Tlaso Kamati Kim, thank you so much. Uh, Shimo Panolti, welcome everyone. Uh, Na Notoka Samuel, my name is uh, Samuel Torres. Um, as uh, Kim mentioned, I'm the Deputy Chief Executive Officer for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, and most recently, um joining the board of directors for eihr so it's it's an honor to join everybody here today not the least of which is because we're joined with uh dr klein um so ramona it's, again it's so really good to see you and be with you um land acknowledgements are a little uh funny especially on a virtual setting but of course we are all in a place and we are all in um in, in a place where we are standing on indigenous land and so where it makes sense for me to share is to give respect to the land that I am standing on right now. Um, so my land acknowledgement, the land acknowledgement that we will um, kind of focus around is, uh, is is on the lands that we now, we now know as uh, Minnesota. Um, with that said, land acknowledgements are a deep commitment, deeper than just checking it off you know, uh, on a list of things to do, we also want to make sure that we're learning and eagerly growing in kinship with the indigenous peoples that are um, on the lands that each of us, wherever we're calling in from today, uh, where we are. So this is a call to to diving in to that learning a little bit more. Um, so in, in the state of Minnesota, multiple boarding schools and the work that NABS has done has identified 23 boarding schools um, that were either operated by the federal uh, program or run by Christian missionaries, but multiple boarding schools have been identified where many children of the 11 Minnesota tribes were forced to attend. The purpose of these boarding schools was to strip away identity, assimilate into the Christian faith, disconnect them from their communities and families and forcibly steal land resources. These repercussions are still prevalent to this day. We would like to acknowledge that our office and where I currently am right now is located in Bde Ota Otunwe or Many Lakes City, the ancestral land of the Dakota, who are forcibly removed from the federal government from this area, but who continue to make their homes and speak their language on these lands. We support the revitalization efforts of the Dakota Iapi and all 11 of the Minnesota tribes well-being and sovereignty. We also acknowledge that this land became known as home to the Anishinaabe people after their migration and our office is located in what they call Gakabikung Ga or at the waterfalls and the Anishinaabe people continue to make their home and speak their language on this land. We support the revitalization efforts of the Anishinaabe Moen and all 11 of the Minnesota tribes well-being and sovereignty. So thank you. All right, so if you two would like to begin your conversation, I'm going to go off screen, but we'll be listening and um, we're ready to um, hear what both of you have to share with us. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you again. Um, I, again, I'm just really honored to be here once, once again with you, Ramona. Uh, it, I feel like being able to, to uh, stand next to you, albeit virtually, um, it just reminds us of our kinship and, of course, the commitment that you and I have spoken about many times to ad addressing these ongoing impacts and making sure that that 
folks know more deeply than just what even online interviews and articles that come out that this is not just something that lives in a history book or that should be a headline and then pass in the news. We're talking about real lives and that this is something that because you and I get to work on together in conversation, I think that because of our kinship and the relationship that you and I have also, um, I hope that there is a level of of comfort and and safety and um, and and really just a, a relationality that uh, will help move and guide this conversation. So, without further ado, I want to invite you to introduce yourself in your own way and um, just to open up the the floor for you. I have, of course, a few questions that I think will help guide. But, um, you know, those beautiful introductions that Kim read, that tells one side of it. And I want to give you the opportunity to share any other pieces about you that you'd like to bring to the forefront, at least at this beginning point. Thank you, Sam. <clears throat> Don Shi, hello. This, is always, <laughs> this always surprises me. Mm. Thank you. I'm very humbled to be here today. My name is Flying Bird Woman. And with that, I have, a, I have a responsibility. I was given a responsibility. And that responsibility is to share a message. And I hope that, I'm, that by sharing my experience, it will help someone know and bring life to that history that, that you just talked about, Sam. Uh, I appreciate everyone tuning in today. I could say this morning, but for some of you, it's early, it's afternoon, but I thank you. And I'm also going to invite you to do two things. One is, I invite you today to listen with your three brains. The one up here, the head, one that helps you make choices, decisions, knowledge, have, have knowledge, listen with that. Listen with the brain in your heart, the one that will help you feel. And listen to the one in your gut, the, your intuition. So I invite you to do that. The second invitation this morning is to invite you to bring to mind a young child, a seven-year-old girl, a little child who is hungry, lonely, alone, cold, just a little kid, just a little kid who could not make, did not have a choice, did not have a choice in what happened to her. So I, I will also share with you this morning to say thank you, because by sharing my story with you, that helps me to learn to trust because that was one of the things that was so difficult for me to do, is still difficult for me to do, to trust you with me, who I am as, as a person. So I, I ask you to listen and to withhold judgment. Bring to mind that little girl. So as, as, as Sam's asked me a, a, a while ago to share with you today, he said, just tell your story. So that little girl was taken, I was taken from her parents. Seven years old, for no other reason than being an Indian child. That was the only reason. To take be taken what appeared to be felt like a very long distance, made over 100 miles, but as a little girl, that was a long, long way. As I, I, was, I was taken to the bus, to where the bus was, a big green bus, one of the things that sticks out in my mind as I, after I boarded the bus with my siblings, my one older sister and three, 
three of my brothers at that time, boarding the bus. And I remember sitting on the bus, looking out on the sidewalk and seeing my mother, the image that's burned in my memory, seeing my mother hold herself like such, holding back tears. And I often wondered, even as a child, I wondered, what is mama feeling? How could, how could one live with knowing there was no other choice? If you want your children to live, to have food, to have shelter, to have warmth, and then send, sending them off. But yet when we arrived, when I arrived at the, at the boarding school, which was over a hundred miles away, to a, what was a cold building, cold in environment, more so than maybe temperature. I just rem remember being it cold because I grew, I grew up with, with uh, eight brothers and sisters. There were eight of us children and my parents. So there were 10 of us in a small shack. It was a house that was approximately 12 by 14 feet in one part of the house and another part that was probably a few feet wide, enough for a twin, no, a, a full size bed, or at that time they called it three quarter size bed where my parents slept and a makeshift closet. So there were 10 people in that area. So going from that area, that home to the dormitory where it was cold, it was seemed to be a really big building to me. Arriving at, at, that, at, at that school and being lined up and taken into the, into the dormitory, one of the first things I remember was being taken into what was, call, was called the linen room. And in the linen room, there were tables covered with white sheets, white bed sheets. There was, a, there was a tall stool. Okay, that little girl I asked you to bring to mind was not only young, not only seven years old in 1954, but she was also little. Uh, and sitting on a stool that was lar tall, stooped up with, I, I don't know what you call the stool, but I remember that stool being high and being sitting on that stool and having the matron cut my hair. I had long hair, but I remember my hair falling, falling to the floor. It was one of the first things they did. From there, then I, I, I was uh, directed to go to one of the tables. And there was another matron there. And they took a fine comb and dipped that fine comb in a container I think it was a coffee can, like a three pound coffee can at that time, dipped that, that uh, fine comb into the kerosene and fine combing our hair, my hair. I did not have head lice when I entered the school. I did have head lice while I was there, but not when I entered. The head lice got so bad while I was there that I had scabs on the top of, on the top of my head, on the crown of my head. And underneath the scabs was head lice. To this day, sometimes when I'm brushing my hair or do, shampooing my hair, and I feel this part of my head, I still have the, that image that, of, of the head lice on my, on, my he, on my head, on my scalp. That's one, that's just one of the triggers that still bring back that emotion. I, rem I remember being given a stack, a, a stack of bed sheets, two, I think bed sheet, uh, and a pillowcase and an army blanket. And later I learned it was a woolen blanket. Uh, so it was, uh, what I do remember is it, it uh, was itchy. I got itchy, it was brown. Assigned a bed, a bottom bunk of a brown metal bed. Uh, if anyone is in the, in the greater Phoenix area and go to the Herd Museum, I don't know if it's, not, if it's still there, I haven't been there for a while, but there's an exhibit of the boarding school, of Fort Totten, the boarding school that I went to. 
And so the bed is, there is an, a, 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 an, ex, an example of the beds that we were slept on at that, at that exhibit. So I, I remember that. The other thing I, I recall very clearly was being, give, being taken to a, a shower, like a group, more than one shower. And we didn't have running water when I was growing up. We didn't have electricity. So a shower was something new. When we took a bath at home, it was in a galvanized bathtub. So that was a new experience for me. But was, what was really harsh was having, being scrubbed with a bar of brown soap that it always reminded me of what my mother made. My mother made lye soap to, to do laundry and to be washed with that. That's what that soap was like. And using a brush, the same type of brush with really stiff bristles that my mother used to, to scrub wooden floors. So we were scrubbed, I was scrubbed. And, and then under the, under the shower, we, I did not have uniforms. So I used the clothing that, that I had, uh, that I brought with, with me, I suppose. I don't have a lot of memories about that. But those were one of the first few, few days, but I, the loneliness set in immediately. It's like, I was among strangers. My sister, my older sister, who is almost six years older than I, was, was assigned to the upper level of the, uh, of the dormitory. And so we were separated by, by age. I was a little girl, she was a bigger girl. And so she was up there. So we weren't, weren't able to, didn't see each other. And my brothers were at yet a different dorm on the other part of campus. So, so that sibling separation was immediately and still has impact today uh, on me. I, none of my brothers are living anymore, but, but with my sisters, my sister, that particular sister, I, I feel a disconnect. And I, I really believe that's part of that early, earlier separation. We were, we were, we were lined up to, to, uh, to go everywhere we went. We were in lines, you know, who lines up, but we were lined and I, taken to the to the cafeteria the boys the boys were on one side and the girls were on the other side so and we were the building was separated by the kitchen in the center as as I remember the food was sparse uh, we ate a lot of mush I think cornmeal type of not so much oatmeal but mostly cornmeal gritty corn, cornmeal uh, we had some kind of a soup every every once in a while. Uh, we did have milk. We didn't have treats. Rarely, I remember it was like an, in a spring one year we had cornflakes. Being introduced to cornflakes, and that was a big that was a that was a big treat. So that was that initial introduction. What was then going back to dorm life? We had a a fair a rigid schedule. As a little girl, to bed at directed to go to bed either at six or six thirty p.m. And I share with people I never slept very much. I still don't sleep very much. And but going to bed at six, I would wake up during the night. And when I'd wake up during the night, I was probably an instigator, but I also woke up other, other girls. There were either eight or 10 of us in a room that, that I recall. And so one of the things that, that I would do was to, to get the girls up and we take that woolen blanket and 
one girl would rock, would sit on the blanket and other girls would pull. So we would run down the hallway and it was fun. It, it was fun because we didn't have toys. We didn't have books. We didn't have any, any of that. So we would strip, pull, pull each other down, down the hallway and get electrical shocks as, as we went around, as we went around the corner, corners of the, in the, in the hallways. Also take our mattress, a mattress off of the, off of the bed and take that upstairs and ride on that. We, that was off limits for us for the most part. So we put that mattress up on, uh, on the top landing, get on that mattress and slide down the flight of stairs to a landing, reposition it and slide down again. Uh, and we were children, so we made noise in the middle of the night. So the matron, matrons lived in the dorm. Ma the matron got up, one in particular was, was very harsh. And the thing that she did was to, Mrs. Gades was her name. And I, she would make me kneel either on a broom handle or a mop handle. The utility closet was right across the room our bedroom, our dorm room. And so the, the broom handles were readily available. And she put that down on the, on the floor. And I was to kneel on, on the broom handle with my arms outstretched, stretched out. She would take a green board. I already prefaced that I was little. I'm, I'm still under tall, but it, I, was, I was a petite little girl. And that board see, at least seemed very big to me. So that she'd take that board, it had, was painted green, there was a lot of green in that school, and she would, there were holes at one end. It was a paddle. And as I knelt there, she would hit, she would strike me. I was often bruised from my back to my buttocks to my upper thighs. I remember specifically making a decision not to cry. Because if I cried, I could go to bed. But that decision was, you're not going to get the best of me. I would, I would not cry. She gave up before I did. And she put, so I was then directed to bed and I went back to bed and I would sleep, still do, with my cheek on my folded hands. And I remember looking at her, probably as a little girl, I was giving her a stare down, but I, 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 I just looked at her and she took her finger and she goes, Ramona Charette, you face the wall. My response was, Mrs. Gades, I am facing the wall. There are four walls in here. So it's kind of a little smart aleck, I suppose. But I got out of bed again. She got me out of bed again, and I got hit again. But I will say that when I made that decision, and I, like I said, I specifically remember making that decision, you will not get the best of me. That has served me well later in life, when I would not let people get the best of me. There was a time when someone tried to get the best of me, but I ma made up th that decision. And we are being called survivors now. Not alumni, but survivors. And I would like to think that I am more of a conqueror. I conquered that treatment Yes, I have scars. I have deep scars, but they are in the process of healing. And I, I'm 75 years old, so I'm three quarters of a century, and they're still healing. But, th but that treatment was, was the, and it was pretty constant. The loneliness, that 
as a, as a young child, the loneliness of not getting the affection in a healthy way, the emotional support that a child needs to develop to be a healthy individual. I remember looking out the window. North Dakota gets cold. North Dakota gets very cold. The windows get frosted. And the window, I remember the windows being frosted at the, from the dormitory and looking out that window, thinking, hoping that maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow I will see mama and daddy. That's the little girl I want you to remember. That's the little girl that brings history to life. The other thing, there are triggers. Samsa asked me along, along the way to share some things and the triggers that are there. I know you can't see this, but this is a flashlight. And there are halos, you know, at night or in the dark, when, when you flash the light, there are halos around this. When I see this, I keep a flashlight by my bed in case of an emergency. And a couple of times I've had to use it. And I remember, just not too long ago, I remember turning on that flashlight at night and seeing that, seeing those halos and that triggered, that triggered a memory of when and hearing keys on a chain, I like a keychain, like like a custodian. But I I remember the hands, the hands. that manipulated that little girl. No little child should ever, ever be touched that way. And as that little person, those hands are huge. That, those hands carrying that flashlight. I could hear the keys and the flashlight looking for me taking these hands underneath that woolen blanket, underneath the stiff sheets. So, so, so those, me those memories are, 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 are there. They are very, very real to me. I, There are the, the, the triggers that that bring about those about those emotions again, all all over again. The feeling of helplessness. I, I, who, if someone said, "Why didn't you tell?" And I said, I say to people. 1954 to 1958, who do you tell? Who would believe me? Who do you tell? And you know that it's going on with other people You know, in, in the dormitory. I hear other little girls crying. Uh, those impact, how that impacted our entire life our entire, the relationships that we have had as a result of that. The, the, the in, and at the same time, the intuitiveness that it helped, I think, helped me develop. As an educator, I was top notch at identifying when a child was abused. 
One of the school counselors, secondary level, used to come and get me. And so he said, Ramona, come on down here, we have a meeting. Almost always, I, I could tell, almost always I, I could tell if a child was, when a child was abused. It's that, I don't know how to explain it other than it was a sense. It was a sense that is recognizable. The, the, uh, the, one, the other practice I think that's important to know about that time in history. At the school that I attended on Thursday afternoon, sorry about that, excuse me. I'll call you back. Sorry about that. I should have taken my. But another part of history, I think, during, uh, during that part of history, on Thursday afternoons at the school that I attended, we had something called religious instruction. And I'm going to guesstimate, but I'm going to say 90% or higher of the school enrollment were Roman Catholic. Uh, the, I think they were gray nuns who used to come down from St. Michael's School to Fort Totten Bureau of Indian Affairs School on Thursday afternoon and some priests. The priests I believe had the high school students, but elementary and junior high kids had sisters, nuns. I could not go to those classes because I was not a baptized Catholic. My parents, uh, even though there was a high population of Catholics in the area that, it, it, in the area that I grew up, my, my parents could not get us baptized because they were not married in the Catholic church. So I got myself baptized. So I could be a part of that. I, one other person and myself were in a separate classroom. We were separated from the Catholic kids uh, to have the missionaries come in and teach us about religion. So I was being feel, I was feeling left out. So I got got myself baptized. And on the on the day I got myself baptized, I got a little chocolate bar, little cherry covered chocolate bar wrapped in a blue wrapping. Father Tim to baptize, bap, had baptism. And so then I could go to the, I could, I could go to the religion instruction. So that was that, that part of the school was, it was a, a part of our routine. But what I find interesting is that memory sticks out to me more than the curriculum in the classroom. I, I don't remember, I don't remember having, uh, learning a whole lot about math, social studies, reading, uh, language arts. I don't remember any of that. What I do remember is being considered a dumb person. I remember sitting on the stool. They had, seemed to have a lot of high stools in that, in that school. I remember sitting in the corner of a school with a brown dunce hat made out of construction paper. Dunce. I didn't know what a dunce was, but I knew I was one. Uh, I didn't know I was a dunce at that time uh, I, until, until later. But I, I do recall the feeling of not being smart. Indian kids can't learn. I didn't know that. I mean, I didn't learn, according to the, the people that we had as educators. What I, what I learned from that and took into my career was to be very careful of how, and intentional, of how I interacted with students. How did I, 
oh, how could I be very intentional about trying to find the gifts, the gifts that each person has? And I tell people, I tell my students, everybody, how are you smart? Everybody's smart. We just have to tap, find the way. We have to find out how people are smart because we know, at least my students knew things I don't know today. I had my granddaughter help me with technology because I don't know that well enough. So trying to find the gifts that other people know. How are we doing on time, Sam? I'm trying to see, see the clock over here. Yes, thank you. No, this is, I, this is really good. I'm so um, glad that you shared to the extent that you, you have so far to this point. There are some questions that are coming in and I of course have some others um, that I think would be worth exploring. And I, and I think just to kind of contextualize, I know we got right into our conversation and um, I think it's important that in conversations like this, that folks such as yourself, Ramona have the freedom and the flexibility to be able to go where you want to and to share what it is that you want to. I think oftentimes when we have conversations like this, there's the hazard of over curation, right? You have 20 questions that you want to get to and then you don't get to actually have a chance to say what you want. Um, so I, I really, I think it's important to keep it open ended like that, but to give some, I think, some context and, and to take a take a step back a little bit, you know, from the perspective of the healing coalition and then working with um you know warriors i love how you put this you know uh ramona instead of you know victims or even survivors which is it which is a lot of what has been used and i you know i think some folks feel empowered by that too because we're still here knowing that genocide was the intention mm -hmm. of boarding schools that the federal mm -hmm. policy um a, uh, towards what was being described as the Indian problem, right? Mm -hmm. in, the, in the 1800s and the early 1900s, and of course, even still to now, um, there was a shift from extermination, massacres, outright theft of land to assimilation and using education as a weapon. So I will say that, you know, just taking a step back, boarding schools was a set of policies that lasted over 150 years that removed thousands, uh, tens of thousands, likely over 100,000 or more um, American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian children from their homes and families. These institutions, they sought to destroy Native languages, cultures, uh, ways of living and being ultimately attempting to dismantle native nations and sovereignty and enable the US government to obtain more land. Education was used as a weapon. Physical, sexual, psychological, and spiritual abuse were all too common. And in hundreds of institutions, NABS has identified 509 institutions throughout the United States from the early 1800s up until um, you know, the late 1900s even. But despite the far reaching impacts, this history remains largely missing from education, curricula, uh, the dominant social and political discourses and are persistently understudied, continue to be understudied by researchers, by scholars. I think now the past couple of years, there's been more attention, of mm -hmm. course, because of Kamloops and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Um, but with with that being said, and given your experience, I I want you to maybe go into a little bit about why you decided to go back into education after having been so deeply affected. Um, given the traumas that you both personally experienced and saw on a regular basis, what was it about the liberating possibilities of education that drew you back in? You and I, you know, I've reflected on this many times. You and I have a very similar set of uh, 
Well, of course, a philosophy on, on education, and I'm, I'm saying this as I want folks to be able to hear from you exactly what your thoughts are about how education can be really idealized and, and, and grounded in your experiences um, of you know, being able to identify children who've been abused, how to co-opt some of those things of education for our people. Can you tell a little bit about why or how you've leaned into education despite having been so deeply impacted by boarding schools? Going into, edu going into education was an opportunity to, there were, at the time that I went into education, there weren't many other avenues to get educated or to, for, especially for women, there were education, clerical work, never make a secretary as you could tell, uh, uh, or medical in the medical field, uh, nursing, and so I as I and because I got a job as a teacher's aide at the time, and now education education specialist or uh, they're called different things paraprofessionals. I would like to address the reason I stayed in education because getting into education was kind of haphazard if you will. There was, I mean, there was an opportunity and, and I took it, but I, I stayed in education because I, I saw a need. First of all, my, I guess my initial, my, my initial um, commitment was because I, and I started out at work at teaching in a Bureau of Indian Affairs school. Uh, and at that time it was BIA, not BIE, now it's BIE. But I, I saw that the children did not have role models. They did not have, we didn't see native people in those roles. And I, I also witnessed how children were being treated and I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to talk, to, to help the children realize that they had they have they had potential. And the first year I taught as a as a licensed teacher, I believe my class load was, was 26. I had 26 students. And most of those, about half of those students did not read very well. So I made a, so then I went back to school and that's how I became a special educator because I knew I did not have the skills to teach the students I had be in a, for, as a, as given to me to, to make a difference. And so I went back to school to become a special educator, to learn, to learn those, to learn those skills. And at the time, at that time, I was, it was about when uh, Public Law 94-142 had just recently been passed. So I got in at the beginning of, uh, of, of that law. The other difference, the reason I stayed was what, when I did become a, a special education, uh, a special educator and a diagnostician is the way things were, the way the school, the department was being run, I thought I could do a better job. I, I thought some other things had to be done. And so I went back to school then for leadership and administration. What was interesting to me was once I learned that, I knew that I had, that wasn't something specifically that I wanted to do because I, I enjoyed working with students on I enjoyed working with the students more than the policy. I liked working with, so I stayed in for that reason. And, and then I thought teachers need to know some more. Teachers need to know what they want, what they're going to face and what they're going to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in when they get out into the field. 
So then I went into higher ed uh, and stayed in, stayed in higher ed and prepared, helped prepare uh, elementary teachers, special education teachers and school administrators. And I wanted to make that overall difference. Uh, and each time, each of those levels, especially in higher ed, it was important to me to try to get the message across to my, to my students to be sensitive to all students. Not only the, not only the, the uh, majority, students that are in the majority, but all students. And how important it is to learn about the different cultural groups. As, as a consultant, one of the things I did and continue to do, I, COVID pretty much closed me down at that, but one of the things that I would make as a part of my practice when I went into a new area was to ride the school bus. Uh, some of the, what I learned was some of the children got up at four o'clock in the morning to catch a bus because of the rural areas. They had early lunch when they got to school. They didn't get back home until 7 p.m. But I learned a lot about the students themselves. So I made it a point to say, I want to ride the school buses to find out where the students are coming from, because that's important for me if I'm going to be serving that community. So more importantly, Sam, I think, I mean, not more importantly, but I think for me, it was um, the reason I stayed in. Yes. Otherwise, I think I'd have been an anthropologist. That, well, hey, you and me both, right? Uh, and what I like to, especially in my, you know, uh, educational leadership for social justice focus a lot of times, you know, as you've, we've talked in very, we have, we have spoken to a great deal about Kind of the work that we do and and how the need for indigenizing and, and diversifying the scope of training for for teachers and i really appreciate mm -hmm. where you're coming from this is that you saw the areas that needed to be changed and addressed in education and then moving from the sphere of influence of your own classroom to a larger area to be able to influence multiple educators and then training teachers training others that are going to be working with you know being leaders of teachers being a leader of teachers, I think, provides a, a great deal of influence. And without that, you know, I think folks are calling it, you know, cultural competency and cultural humility and, and, and you know, references like that, how important it is to have a diversity in the workforce uh, with respect to teaching and education. And why, if it's too homogenous, if you only have one set of perspectives, your classroom is going to be far more diverse and and how are you going to address that um this to me demonstrates a fundamental need for uh why it's important to have native people in education have native people in these places of great influence um so you know the conversations that you and i get to have we see things in in this kind of perspective but folks are often looking at this for the first time, right? That's why we need folks mm -hmm. from all different kinds of perspectives mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. these decisions mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and working in this way. Similarly, you and I, this past year, had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C., uh, where you had the opportunity to testify in the House Natural Resource Committee for Indigenous Peoples. And we saw together firsthand the impact, the direct impact of what it looks like when Native people are in Congress, when they're working mm -hmm. in D.C., mm -hmm. and how powerful that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can you speak to that a little bit and then share just briefly a little bit about your experience and why it's so important that we have a Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding Schools uh, act to create a dialogue, a center of dialogue for this moment right now, specifically? I personally, professionally believe that we wouldn't be here where we are today, Sam, addressing the kinds of concerns that need to be addressed had there not been Native people in those positions in DC. 
with Sec Secretary Holland in her in her position, the legislators who were in that in that position, bec because so much has not been written into history. So we need we need those voices. We need we need that support. And I, I've been asked, weren't you nervous to speak to con Congress? No, I wasn't. I wasn't because as I look at them, they're just people. They're just sure they have a position, but they are they are just people who are rep ought to be representing us. And however, when after I finished testifying, I felt empowered. I felt empowered because I could. I could be a voice to for so many other people who have had a similar experience to mine. And again, those stories need to be heard. I think we have to unravel and hear the stories as much as we can, as many stories as we can, because by sharing that those stories, it's also healing not only is it healing for myself but i hope that it's educating it's informing people of what what happened and what ne what didn't us uh, what never ceased to amaze me was how many people there are that did not know about boarding schools one of one of my one of the people that i know who who is a geographically a neighbor in the state of North Dakota, she said, I should have known that. You weren't but 100 miles. But there are also people who are adjacent to a reservation, to my reservation, who says, I didn't know that. And I just wanted to go, really? <laughs> it was like, everybody should know this. But they didn't. So I think as, as a, taking on that responsibility of sharing those messages and educating. Um, yes, incredible. Thank you for that. And while we're getting to the end of, of our, our time together, I just want to just share deep gratitude to you, Ramona, for sharing your story, sharing just a piece of, of your life with us. And, and I, I think it's really important that, you know, what we've been alluding to is that this moment of history ought not to be seen as just something that has in continues to invisibilize or 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 traumatize uh, or you know subjugate and mitigate you know the humanity of indigenous peoples i think what you really shared today was also sort of that the side of resilience and um engaging this as a moment to to build community and collective power and and to uh to go into spaces and to to create forward thinking spaces so that everyone can be um, can be included, humanized, protected. Um, also just demonstrating the healing power of telling one story, as you mentioned. Um, there's of course hazards of um, not being in a centered place, asking somebody to share who maybe not be in that in that 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 place. Um, secondary trauma as, as they call it. But, you know, what I'm confident in is that, you know, you and I, we're gonna, we're gonna debrief a little bit after this call, we, you know, talk every now and then we have a relationship and there's a, there's a, um, there is a reasonable way, a responsible way of, of going about this. So, so thank you for, for sharing and for leaving us on a, on a good note, on an optimistic note. Um, and so with that, you know, in my in my language. Thank you very much. May I share something? Do we have time just to share something? Uh, yes, yes. yes. Okay. In in the book Stringing Rosaries by Dr. Denise Lajmader, she interviewed me and she selected 16 stories. Uh, there you go. And after she interviewed me, she asked if she could use uh, if she could use my name and my initial response was no, I didn't want people to know this, but she left, she left my house and I don't think she, she went but a few blocks 
And then I thought, no, people need to know this. So I sat down and I wrote this. I tell people I'm not a poet, but this is what I wrote at the time. And it's titled, Hear My Voice. Hear my voice and hear the pain that sears my soul. Feel the pain of the little girl. Smell the air. Smell the scent of brill cream that brings back memories in a flash. Taste the salt. Know that tears help heal. See the hands that reach for that little girl. Know that it will not be forgotten. Embrace the love that should have been there, that set me free to live a life without pain. I thank you for listening today. I appreciate, I feel humble that you asked me. Um, and if there's something I could do for to help, let me know. It's my mission. Thank you so much, Ramona. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your willingness to share today. This has been amazing. Um, and thank you, Sam, for, for leading this. This has been wonderful. Um, I am going to stop recording. And what we typically